Okay, we're about to end. Is everybody ready? So what we're gonna do is Christian is gonna go around with the microphone and we're gonna have two people per table sharing. It's gonna be quick. We, I wa we want you to say your name, where is your memory, what place, and what is the memory? Then Bijeta here, and I'm sorry, I did not present Vigeta and Katie, who are also from Salazar. They're supporting us here. Uh, Vigeta is gonna write in the board this information, okay? Then I will explain you why we're doing all this. You wanna see why. Uh, so let's start with this table here, um, Christian. So who we have two people from that table that wanna share their experience. So one, let's pick one, just one. Like, okay, let's go first with the volunteers. Any volunteer or do you want me to pick you? Okay, okay. there you go. Okay. So do you want to explain your memory? Yeah, uh, please say your name, okay. the place, and then what the memory is. Okay, so my name is Kelvin Valdovinos. Uh, the place is Diamond Lake. Um, it's about a couple hours away from Crater Lake. And it's just, this is supposed to be like a little cabin uh just the tent right here so it's just basically camping we used to go as a family a lot and with my dad's friends um when i was uh younger so it was just nice to be there and created a lot of memories uh here's the big lake right here um yeah so that's about it it's just kind of remembering those good childhood memories with friends and um it's kind of sad that they're i mean you could still do it but just yeah it was kind of nice and relaxing thank you one more person in that table person in this table Uh, hello, I'm Tana, and um, mine is in Montana, where I grew up, um, and the cow is actually supposed to be a pig, because we used to raise pigs, and um, it's just uh, my parents' home when I was growing up on uh, a little farm. Thank you. Thank you so much. And let's go to the next table. Volunteers. Okay, there you go. Um my name is Renee Johnson, and I'm from Oak Grove, Oregon, which is near Oregon City, Oregon, where the hacky sack was created. Mm -hmm. So I grew up playing hacky sack. 
Nice. And I still play. It's a great lifelong sport. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? I'm Jessica, and this is a tree in my aunt's backyard. When I was little, I was just one of the, um, all my cousins were boys and everybody around me were boys and I was the only girl and I always had to prove myself. And so it's just me in the tree the first time I climbed a tree and made it as high as the boys. So Thank you. Yeah. That's yeah. exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Next table, volunteers. Okay. Um, my name is Charlie. I grew up in Oahu. So I made, um, we live next to like a big field. Um, so me and my cousins would just go over there and wreak havoc. Um, my uncle built like a, there was like a tiny little water stream. So he built like a two plank bridge. So we would always have to like, you know, traverse that. And then we had like a little plumeria tree next to it. So yeah. Thank Great. you. Thank you so much. Someone else on this table? My name is Greg. Uh, mine is a, a memory from when I was a kid in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, my grandfather had this old adobe house that he built himself. And in the back, he had these trees and a garden and chickens. And I remember as a kid watching, he built these little tiny canals to get the water from one tree to the, to the wells. So we'd follow the water around the trees and the creek. It was like a little creek for us and then an oasis in the desert. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, this, let's go on the back over there to see someone on the back there. Um, a couple of people in sitting in tables and the chairs. Sorry, did not anyone did uh, an exercise? No, nope. over here. So it was fun to have a memory because I hadn't thought about it for a while. But I remember as a child, I grew up in a logging camp. And every summer, my parents and our friends would go to Neskowin. And at that time, you know, um, it wasn't as popular as it was now. And they would just drink beer and eat crab and play cards. They just let us run free. And we would build little huts on the beach out of driftwood. And they let us sleep overnight in them. It was really amazing, you know. Nice. That sounds fun. Thank you. Next one person, person, one more. In the back, you're in their family childhood memory. Here at the front, here. your name and please in uh, juan campos hacienda cdc uh, so my memory was a uh, grandmother decorating a stop sign post on the green belts on the sidewalk to make them a little prettier so flower butterflies it was uh brought back memories of uh grandmother thank you thank you so much well thank you so much um for now vigeta has been writing there uh, some of these memories and, and then um, um, one of the things that I wanted to tell you is why we do this exercise. As you all can see and feel now, you feel so much better. You feel in a different set of mind. Your brain is relaxed and everybody's enjoyed. It breaks the eyes a little bit without being that awkward. So um, it really puts aside all the egos and everybody is kind of on the same level on the table. So we can, then we can have a conversation for whatever is happening when we do any of the workshops that we do. So this has been a great way to start any of the, our workshops. So um, if you want to go to the next slide. Oh, no, before um, there was a, okay. So the, we're going to share the themes here um, that we want to find what are the common things that we can hear in all these uh, memories? Can you, anybody can have some ideas of what we hear? Yes, go ahead. Family. Digital. Home. Big spaces. A lot of nature. Nature, water, spaces, family, curiosity activity, happiness, freedom. Any other common themes, any? I didn't hear your iPhones, your iWatch, yeah. your Teslas. That's another good, that's, <laughs> yeah. So that's another thing that we learned with this memories is that people's memories are not related to electronics, to gift, to watching movies or anything, it's about the moment and what you felt at the moment 
and that is kind of the basic core of our needs as humans. So that's some of the things we learned that with um, with all this uh, workshop that been doing. So then we're gonna now we're gonna go to the kind of more serious um, and talk a bit more about why we're here talking today with you guys. Um, let me move to my slide. So um, the city of Talon, Oregon is located within um, the cities of Ashland and Medford and the southern part of the state. It is surrounded by farmland and forestry. And this is the land of the Athabascas, Shada, and Takilma tribes. Europeans and white settlers arrived here in 1852, forcing tribes to move out of their lands. And this is the, the settlements that we have now. This, in September 2020, the Almeida fire burned over 3,000 acres across the Rogue Valley and destroyed most of talent. Next slide, please. About 60% of the businesses in Talent were destroyed. And this fire especially impacted the community of immigrant workers that lives in mobile homes and apartment buildings, people without insurance and uh, lack of resources. And we'll next slide. In the past year, there have been efforts to support this community. Talent Gateway Transitional Housing Project provides the transitional homes and for families displaced. And this was a joint effort between Truria and the Phoenix Talent School District, as well as donation for the state of Oregon, and the Medford Bay's People's Bank. So as our architect has been part of these three key projects, the Talent Master Plan and Gateway Site Study, the CASA Workshops, and the Talent Mobile Estates Project. The three projects have been a joint effort between, as you see here in the graphic, TURA, which is the Italian Urban Renewal Agency, Salazar Architect, Coalición Fortaleza, and Casa of Oregon. This project had not been able to be successful without any of the team, especially, especially Casa Coalición Fortaleza, who have been a key member of the, the group. Next slide. We have done about four community engagement. We started in April uh, 2022 uh, with a collaboration with Placid and uh, Preform, James, Roja, James Rojas and John Camp. Following, um, there have been the workshop with CASA that have been, um, we actually finished like one last weekend. The goal has been to listen to the community members about their needs, desires, and visions of the sites they call home. More than 70 people have been sharing their stories, their memories, and their needs with the, the vision of what the city and the spaces they, they, they leave will be used. And this is a graphic showing a bit of how the community workshop informed our design and how we get there. Um, next slide. Each workshop has about the two components. One is that memory, um, component, the one exercise that you just did. And then after that, we usually move to an exercise about your ideal site, your ideal home, ideal place, ideal city, what, what is that we want to accomplish with that workshop. We learn from our research uh, from James and John's too, that, uh, and from all our workshops that we've been doing through the years that um, um, tactile, when you touch objects, it gives you a different sense of communication and you are able to say things that you cannot put words to it. We are able to communicate with people that might have been difficult communicating and not because of the, they can't speak, but because of the, they, they might be afraid to speak in public for whatever reason is. So this has been a great opportunity and great way for us to understand and, on, and get to know the communities and what they want us to, support them. This exercise allowed more creativity and we have seen so many amazing projects coming out of that. You see in the pictures here, there is everybody's participating and everybody always ends up very happy. Just wanna say that. Uh, the following slide shows a little bit of what are those common things that came out of our talent uh, workshops. 
And here it is more like specific to the side, but if you read between the lines, you can see that there are nature, community, family, happiness, uh, pets, dogs, animals are involved in all this. Same themes that we hear today here. And that kind of brings us to that we are all pretty much the same. We all have the same needs. Doesn't matter where we live, where we come from. The following, the following uh, slide shows some of the three uh, uh, master plans concepts that we came up based on these themes. And there were um, one based on wild urban, the, another one entertainment and community, another one for housing and businesses. And the three were the earlier early draft that then after going through presented to the tour, we, next slide, we came up with the final master plan that kind of sum up some of these elements all together, uh, built into the idea of blurring nature and urban spaces together in similar ways that you find in trails and parks dispersed in the city around. The next slide, it is a quick, this is the, the site uh, that we, the talent mobile homes that uh, mobile states that we are working with CASA and this site plan is being modified and adapted by what we learned from the community and how they want these places to be way more nature incorporated within the spaces, more community spaces for them to get together and rebuild their community. Next slide. And then now let's see, we are, we are five minutes earlier, so we're good. So we can set our panel conversation. I want to sit here and I want to see if I can see people. <laughs> um, that might be better. Yeah. Okay. Um, we we really see we had some questions that we wrote that um what's your impression let's start with you uh celestina um after hearing some of the common themes today and the ones that you heard in talent and was there anything that really came up as a particular surprise i don't know if you want to use Hello. maybe yes okay there we go. Good morning. Um, thank you all for coming. I just want to start with that. Um, and I also want to say, especially to everyone online or not especially, but including everyone online, um, that we so wish that Coalición Fortaleza could have been here um, and they weren't able to, but just know that they are such a huge part of this work and this project as they are community-based organization. Um, that uh, what we offer today is our best effort, but really, if you want to dig into this project more, um, that's the piece that we'll be missing today, um, and it's and it's a big piece. So, um, thank you to Erika and Selines and all of the coalition team uh, because they're really amazing and they're doing all so much of the community engagement work. Um, in terms of you know what. The themes that we heard today and themes that we have heard in talent um, over the course of a series of three community engagement events, you know, Ernestina already highlighted, as you all highlighted yourselves, these these common themes that are pretty universal. Um, and I think the what was important for me to be reminded of in these community engagement meetings is that even while they, these themes are really universal and, and it's helpful to pull them out, they're also applied in really particular ways to different communities. And so we can't just know that we have these themes and then still go back into our offices and make our plans on our computers and then assume that they're going to work for the communities. You know, just in our last community engagement event, we were talking about the kitchen gathering space in the community building, which on the one hand seems like a given, um, you know, of course, folks are going to want to to gather and to have a place to have events and fiestas and things like that. But at the same time, one of the things that came out was that the focus that the community wanted was for that space to be a reheating and staging and presenting place for 
for their, you know, food prep for parties rather than really investing heavily in food prep in the community building, which on a project at this, you know, this size and with the community building such a being such an important part of the project, those nuances about how do does this community want to experience this part of their space uh, was just another reminder to me of how important it is to um, both know that these themes are here and also make sure that we're really, really listening. Christian, do you want to also respond a little bit on that question? Uh, sure. Since you have been in all these workshops. Yeah, well, uh, for me, it was a really a special location because this was the first time that we have the chance to give these workshops in Spanish. So it was something that it, that I truly feel connected because like uh, me coming from another place, I like I'm giving the chance to these communities to raise their voice and to kind of feel like uh, this is a situation that they have been feeling vulnerable for so long that this is like a little step that to feel less vulnerable, making them understand your paper language and don't have like a language barriers. We also have like a, we use our resources to to have like a bilingual sessions and all all these situations. So just feeling the 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 this kind of like vulnerability, like cape falling down in front of me, and saying like, hey. Thank you for so much. Like I even start like, of course, like learning their names, like they start recognizing, like every time you start going back to this area, you start feeling like a little bit of our community. So it's like, I don't know how many thousand people lives in the area, but feeling special that you're getting like on, like to connect with the community and for them to give you uh, the confidence to express themselves. It was something that was really important. So I think like it was a big ticket for like a big, Take away for me just being able to connect with the people uh, and then explain our process and, and helping to build this this project. So it was a it was a really special part for me. Thank you. Um, this next question, I'm gonna probably ask you, John, to support me in this one. Um, two years after the fire and with so many people displaced, what's the value of lengthy community engagements and design? Shouldn't our focus be on rebuilding as much as possible and as soon as possible? Good morning, and uh, thank you for being here today. You know, I, I really took some time to really want to address these questions today because, you know, I, I lived this whole experience for two and a half years with this community. And I think, you know, we really have to remember that when a natural disaster takes place out there, it casts a huge white net across the community, right? And our community consists of all different diversities, ethnic backgrounds, and income level, right? So when we go to think about rebuilding and having that population come back in, we have to be cognizant of making sure we engage all of our community members in that rebuilding process. And one of the other things that I've learned through this whole experience is that we have national resources that come in and provide those services, but we have folks that fall through the cracks and we don't meet the needs of all of our population needs. So people that do not have insurance. So it's real important when you look to rebuild a community that you work at the ground level and that you bring all your families back home. And that's something that we really strive to do in this rebuilding process. And we're going to continue, you know, to see that in other natural disasters that take place, you have to remember that there's a large voice out there, but there's other voices that we need to make sure we need to include in that rebuilding process there. So that's important to consider. Thank you. Let's see, um, my question, next question is for Celestina. Yes. Yeah. 
bring bringing the the generations together and how do how do we able to be make community with bringing them all at the same time i want yeah, that's a great question and and when we did this in talent the first time we really did a tremendous amount of outreach to make sure we had all the different age groups at the table and it was really exciting because we had maybe like 10 tables right so we had you know uh, high school students, 20 to 30 year old seniors. And when they were all sitting around the table, they all of a sudden just started collaborating and sharing different ideas and all respecting and going back to putting everyone on an equal playing ground. Everyone just all of a sudden just started really communicating. And then we took those designs and ideas to the paper. And it was just really instrumental to see the different age groups interacting. And it was a great way to do that from, from a community engagement standpoint there. They ha we haven't moved forward with the project yet, right? So right now it's in the early design stages, so. Thank you. And just a reminder, we can probably leave the questions to the end and then just think about them. And then by the end of the panel discussion, I will open up for questions for everybody, including online too. Thank you. Um, my next question goes to Celestina. And um, why CASA? has committed so deeply to community engagement? And how has the feedback helped to inform your work as a developer? So <clears throat> I don't think that, you know, anybody uh, can really be doing this work without centering community engagement first. So the why I think is, I guess what I'm saying is I think I'm talking to, preaching to the choir. Why are we communicating and engaging with the community um, because that's who we're trying to serve. So we have to, we can't be um, separate from and then somehow come up with something that's going to work and actually meet the needs of the community if we're not talking to the community. So um, like I said, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir on that. Um, what I think that even this project um, I would like to try and uh, do better on and in future projects is the fact that we're still doing community engagement means that somehow we're still holding this power over those that we're serving because we are inviting folks. We even still use that word. We're inviting folks to the table to give us their engagement. And then we go back and we make the decisions. And I don't have all the answers, but I do know that at some point in the process, the next step is actually to say, how are we preparing our communities and our community members themselves so that when these times come, when disaster comes or when an inflection point in the community comes where we need leaders and we need decisions to be made and projects to be moved forward, that there are folks already in the community who have the resource and the background to be able to, to do the work themselves, essentially. Um, again, I don't have all the answers on how we get from here to there, but that's really um, the, the vision and the hope, I think. And that's part of ultimately um, the part of our cooperative um, model that our department brings. So I'm not sure how familiar anyone uh, or everyone is with this particular project, but just to highlight a few things, um, it is the redevelopment of a manufactured home park. So um, all but 10 homes in the park burned in the fire. The homes have not yet been replaced. So this is a, a project in process, but uh, a lot of community engagement work has been done already, which is part of the context that we're bringing here um, today. But uh, ultimately, the park will be a resident owned community via a cooperative. And so that's one way that I know for sure that we are making progress on this point of, you know, not doing community engagement anymore, but actually just giving the control back to the community, not having uh, as much, um, uh, you know, really as many of these tables and more of those tables uh, in all of these processes. Thank you. This next question, I don't know if Selena and um, Celestina and, or, or John can support me on this one. We'll see how we go. As um, <clears throat> the Almeida fire had a devastating impact on individuals, families, businesses, and community. Nearly um, 2,500 homes were destroyed and 42,000 people displaced as a community activist and organizer. Do you feel the collective trauma change how folks relate to
to one another and responded to the immediate aftermath of the disaster and two years later? Well, this is, you know, something I can really share is that, you know, real trauma after natural disasters is just, um, it's, in, you know, it's just so heartful to see. I can't tell you how many meetings that we were in and folks would show up and they didn't have a place to live and literally be crying there trying to find a spot to go. So short-term trauma is just dramatic to families and it's a community that they lived in, right? And so the leadership of talent really realized it was important to try and get the families with children back into the community to help stabilize their population and back into the school district. So we partnered with the Phoenix Talent School District to really work on focusing on families that did not receive FEMA housing to bring them back into the community and trying to provide that short-term trauma relief through housing. The long-term trauma still can, goes on and it'll go on for many years and probably decades with these folks. There's several times they've come in, I've met with them, they're still, you know, going through the, the trauma of that fire, living in the community, trying, they've lost everything, trying to restart their whole lives, you know, so trauma goes on for a long time. And what's real important is really making sure that we have supportive services there immediately and thinking about how we provide those supportive services for short term, but even long term, these families are still going to need long term trauma support there. Thank you. Do you want to complete something, Celestina? Yeah, I do. And I, and I realized that in my last question or my last answer, I kind of left something out and it ties in really well, which is that um, part of the community engagement work that we're also um, focusing on in this project is collaborating with Coalición Fortaleza, like I said. So they're a um, community-based, culturally specific organization of folks from the community who are informing um, and really have a voice in, in every step of the process. And so I think um, also relating to how are we connecting and supporting community and trauma? Well, your own community members, our own community members, whenever we've experienced trauma is a really good place to start. Um, and so I can't, I can't stress enough um, how integral that partnership is right now, the partnership between Casa of Oregon and Coalición Fortaleza to um, be as uh, responsive and supportive um, and engaging and collaborative, uh, both for uh, the process of of designing and moving the project forward. And also when we think about the realities of the trauma that the community is still processing and they've got awesome, um, you know, awesome projects ahead. I know that they're thinking of even using the site in the interim while we're still don't have homes on the site uh, as a location for some art projects for the community. So um, again, I, I just can't stress enough uh, how much uh, great work they're doing and how important I think it is for any projects I'll be on in the future to have a collaborative local um, organization to work with. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, um, um, Christian, I'm going to have you as a, now to respond to this question and how has this community engagement informed your design process? Well, I think like, uh, it has been like a really constant, like a uh, feedback and validation process for the design. Like, I uh, having like the chance to have this series of workshop let us to introduce like in a greater greater level any any concern it feels like a little bit less rush and it feels like you are paying like enough attention to any subject so i think like uh, all these uh, advance and progress that we have done it's really truly guided by the community and you can really understand like their specific like needs we understand of course like a uh, there is this up like a um, superficial level of general needs and everything but Making making a project a little bit more responsive to the community has been something that it's evident. Like when you start like having this, like community guidance uh, decision, so it just feels like a, that you are like a, having like a better, uh, I don't know, better confidence to 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 approach to the to this to the design to the next phase, and also seeing like a, a little miss change, but showing the community that you listen to them, it's something important that impacts into in like with them and it only allows you to have like 
a little bit more deeper um, um, uh, information that they can share with you because they feel a little bit more like safe and and secure. So then it's just evident that you are listening to the community. Thank you. And John, from the political civic leadership front, can you speak to the structural purpose uh, of the Talent Urban Renewal Agency and its role in the rebuilding process? I think you spoke a little bit on that, but I don't know if you want to. I think one of the, you know, the leadership of talent um, really understood that, you know, there's a community there and they really wanted to bring that community back home to talent, right? And recognizing that with your leaders immediately that to be able to bring all your different types of families back home is real important. And that was good leadership that uh, the talent community has. And they strove and they drove forward to that to making sure they're bringing their families back home from there. Thank you. Um, let's see, this is a very hard one question. Um, <clears throat> thinking about climate risk projections, what, are you, what do we say to people when asked if we should be re re rebuilding here at all? And then, I don't know, Celestina, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. Um, I think it's a question without a very clear answer, um, but I do know that it's that we can't only be thinking about this abstract map that has some risk assessment associated to, uh, you know, a neighborhood or a region, an area for any type of risk. Wildfire is the one that we are talking about a lot here on the West Coast, but you know, of course, there are others throughout the country and. Um, we can't just look at the map and then allocate our dollars based on a map. There, there are people, longstanding communities um, throughout our state and across the coast. And uh, I think that the idea that we can uh, just push folks out into some other location that has a lower risk threshold as an end-all be-all solution is missing um, the point of of embedded community and the connection that's there and how much uh, power and support that actually offers community members who are there and how much would be lost uh, by taking um, an approach of just kind of separating everyone out and saying, go live somewhere else. Um, and on top of that, there's a lot of privilege in the idea that you can just pick up and go somewhere else and find the same life and the same stability. Uh, there's there's so much that's offered by community connection and uh, relatives and family and extended family and chosen family and everything that comes from building a community in a particular location. Um, so you know it's a it's a big question, um, but I do think that we just have to keep those things in mind as well. Yeah, I'm just going to build build on that because I think you you really have to remember that when people talk about rebuilding, we're talking about people's homes that they lost, right? That's what they truly lost at the end of the day. And you know, even though Oregon has uh, climate risk situations, fires, or some of our towns are located in these forest areas, but again, you know, community, these individuals and families, they have a strong sense of community, right? they're rooted in their community or town, their churches, and you just can't up and relocate them to another you know, location, right? So just really making sure that we pay attention to that in the rebuilding process. I think one of the areas we can be stronger is just thinking about across the state, how we can be more resilient now as we move forward, we're gonna to continue to have natural disasters, but how do we start to plan for that in the future there? But again, remember, you know, these are people's homes. They've lived in the community. They got ties to the community, their neighbors, their friend, their churches. You just can't move them to another location. So that's important to consider in the rebuilding process. You're okay. Yeah. Well, that was going to be actually then my next question was going to be a, how do we make this community safe and resilient? Um, um, and what, uh, what can that community engagement can add to this process and how do we make that? You wanna start? Sure, sure <laughs> Okay. Sure. Uh, you know, it, I think there's a lot of things we can do, you know, continue to having good community engagement, but also just um, really thinking about bringing multi-stakeholders into the conversation, right? Nonprofits, governmental agencies, for-profits, 
and really just think about how we can leverage all those resources to be more resilient in our communities that we design in the future. That's going to be very helpful as we move forward there. So I think a combination of all those different actors in the marketplace are going to help us, you know, climate change is here. We just got to start embracing it and figuring out how we become more resilient in these communities that we build here. And these processes are very meaningful. Thanks, Christian. <laughs> um, to piggyback on that a little bit, I think that we can think about resilience both in a technical way, like a materials way, like how is this environment actually going to be built back better and be re more resilient? Um, and I think that those answers are um, maybe less exciting, but important. Like, you know, we need fire hardening on, on every structure that's going to be placed there for sure. No question, right? It's kind of a gimme. Um, and then also coordinating with uh, natural resources advisors and what are we planting here and where are we planting it and what's the strategy and the approach here in terms of fuels and varying, you know, trying to hear all opinions on that as well, because even on this one project, we've had a couple different opinions on uh on landscaping and the interplay, um, you know, with fire. And so really just trying to listen to everybody and, and take the most strategic approach. Um, so that's like the technical concept of resilience that we all, um, I think, can think of and comes to mind easily. Uh, but then there's this interpersonal resilience that John was talking about. And I would love to also think about the, what I was hinting at earlier, which is how are we engaging the everyday stakeholder and preparing folks to become their own leaders and to become uh, the folks who are leading the charge in times of recovery, in times of prevention, while the, while the disaster is ongoing um, and setting up more network and infrastructure and education and prepare folks with the right lingo and the right um, know-how kind of so that when the time comes, uh, yes, we have nonprofits. Yes, we have government. Um, yes, we have some for profits involved, you know, helping with funding and, and other resources, but also we have the voices on the ground ready to go. Um, that's what I would really love to see in our resilience building. Thank you. Christian, do you want anything complete or? Yeah, well, this is the last part. Like, I think like a community engagement right now has to be like seen a little bit more like the opportunity to create like this special connection. Like every project is like a tailor like suit. And if you don't, I mean, you haven't seen and introduced yourself, you don't know the voice or like the body of the person who are you're gonna be doing this tailored project, it's a little bit harder. And I think like um, it has been lately more considered like a, just like a checkbox to kind of feel like we are doing our good to listen to people. But I have seen like, a, uh, I have seen how these people get exposed and a lot of them, like even like like I mentioned earlier, like we did in Spanish, like there was been people that who didn't know how to to read or to write. And it was just like seeing their, their faces, like our like the little answers, like please you just we just need a home. It's just like it really gets you like in a vulnerable. So it's like if I didn't have like these moments or share this this, this um situation in the community engagement, I'll I will have seen these projects in a different level. I think like uh, the social situation of the COVID and then all this like housing, it, it has given us the chance to to interpret different like the place that we live. It's just not like merely like a four walls or something like that. So we understood that special connection to the place that you like most like live all the time. So we want to give them like that chance to other people. So I think community engagement in, in general will be a good like, a, it's like, a, kind of hidden gem that you can explode if you really want to get like a uh, deeper into the projects. Thank you. Great answers. Um, and we are almost to the uh, questions, but before we move on to the audience questions, um, and I know we all talk about a bit about what are the lessons learned and the takeaways about <laughs> that are worth really noting for the audience here. Um, you want to start, Celestina? Yeah, um, this was definitely the most robust community engagement process I'd been a part of as uh, on a project, and um, I think one of the biggest lessons is don't stop. Like, just 
like, this is good. Keep going. Um, do as much as you can. Um, and I think the lesson learned is that we just have to keep directing resources directly to the community and um, see what more we can do. Uh, I think that, again, Christian was sharing that these sessions were uh, in Spanish first and then with English translation for folks because that was the need in the community. And that in and of itself was a really big win um, to be uh, prioritizing the language that uh, had the most speakers in the room. Um, so a lot of small, I mean, not small, a lot of, a lot of wins along the process. And the more that we can bring those folks in uh, to every step of the process is my hope. And ultimately part of that is dollars. You know, I don't know if it's a staff position in future projects where we're able to hire someone directly from the community. I mean, we have this collaboration with Coalición Fortaleza and they are local community members. And so, and we are hiring them as part of the project. So that's a, definitely a way that we've started that process and just to lean in more and more and more to, you know, how do we almost become like consultants to the community if they need a little bit of advice here and guidance there? That's my pie in the sky. Well, having again lived this for two and a half years and from, you know, concept to completion, the one thing I would anyone in the audience I would tell you is that, you know, Oregon does a great job of, you know, emergency management. We've really focused on emergency management after we have a natural disaster, right? But where we have to really improve and think about this is how do we go through recovery? How do we handle recovery when we have a natural disaster that occurs? And I've had a lot of time to think about this. And, you know, what I would suggest to anyone here in the audience, talk to your city councilor, talk to your county commissioners, talk to your representatives. What's really important is we need a playbook that shows how we go through the recovery process that educates our cities and counties. So we you know, start working at a community engagement now, where are you gonna have your recovery sites at, right? That, was, that would be a tremendous help to our state to get ahead of that. We've done everything on the emergency management recovery, but we, we need to really start thinking and focusing when this natural disaster happens in your city, in your town, on the coast, we have all these, possibilities that can happen. Where are you going to put the families when this happens? And what's that look like for your community? If you get ahead of that now and have that in place, it'll make it a lot more successful for you. Thank you. And um, one last question before we move on. Um, we heard about a sort of like top down and the bottom up approach to community engagements and design, which takes a lot of investment, commitment and co coordination uh, between stakeholders. And what is one thing that you would have done differently? And one thing any organizer and or leader in this space right now here can, should use as a guide in the unfortunate reality of future disasters. And I know you just mentioned some, but. Uh... Again, I, I think one of the important things, if we start thinking about where these recovery sites are going to be in your community, right, there's a lot of opportunity to, to be able to think about how you cr cross program, you know, parks, open spaces, empty parking lots. That's important to think about where your infrastructure is and how you could set that up ahead of time, right, and who are going to be your partners to come in and run your shelters, run your transition housing. That's something that we can get ahead of and have our community engagement now and identify those sites. It's really challenging once you've had that natural disaster and then the families are dispersed and you're trying to come back in. So just thinking of what are those assets in the community? What are those natural disasters that could impact our community? And where will we put the recovery housing at and bringing the families back? That's something that we could really work on ahead of time is cross programming those assets, right? And, and even like what happened in Alameda with the fire, right? They shut down the I-5 corridor and they routed trucks through the town, which really made it challenging for families to get out of town and exit, right? So even from like ODOT's perspective, thinking of where are spaces that we can, you know, park people, how do we, how do we stop and utilize some of our open spaces? What are other areas that we can cross program? So that needs to be done, you know, statewide for our cities. And I think it'll really be helpful for us in the future. I don't think so. I'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Well, we can open it up now for 
questions to the public. Anybody has any questions? Yeah. Uh, hold on. Let me pass it. Yeah. It would be easier. Thank you. Thank you. I really like the idea. Um, what you were mentioning earlier about like where the recovery places would be and it just a light bulb went off because, um, well, for starters, my name is Stacy, and I'm one of the home ownership program coordinators at PCRI. Um, so like myself and some of the ladies, um, we would like engage, like, what if the world ends? Like, what are we going to do? And so I'm one of those people who likes to like plan, you know? Um, so with that being said, when you're talking about the recovery, um, places or whatnot I'm just curious is part of the plan it seems like it is like the cross programming if you know you would have the youth involved because if you lose mom and dad like how are you going to survive like that whole situation like everybody's running screaming everything you know um so I think would be really cool is like to kind of put them in situations to kind of plan for that right like have an emergency kit or whatever like where is our meeting destination if this happens if we don't have those recovery recovery centers or whatever so yes I'm glad that you're thinking about those things. Thank you for mentioning that because I'm always thinking that way. Something can happen important. Like, where am I going to go? You know, so that's awesome. But my question originally is, um, since the project is a cooperative, um, what will be the process of becoming a, a owner of the home? And will the youth be able to learn what home ownership or cooperative can do to enhance their lives? Yeah, great questions. So um, in the manufactured Sorry, I'm gonna put my coffee down. That was louder than I intended it to be. Um, the manufactured home park uh, model uh, and the cooperative model just changes the ownership of the park, but doesn't really change the housing type itself is that somebody owns the home, uh, but the land below it is not subdivided. It's not parceled out. It is part of a contiguous piece of land uh, that is the park. So, there are a number of reasons that has come to be. Uh, John would probably be someone to talk to more about uh, urban planning and how we've zoned and how we've created this housing type that is often, um, not exclusively, but often in the situation. So you own your home, you don't own the land below it. So typically, uh, these parks have been developed as investments from an investor owner. Um, occasionally, that owner is actually a resident of the park, um, but they collect rents, space rents, from uh, each homeowner. So, uh, and part of what I'm getting at here is this is a slightly different model of homeownership than classic fee simple real estate, which is what we most think of when we think of homeownership. You own the home, you own the land beneath it. Um, so it is a version of homeownership, but it is a little bit different than that. So um, the part of the reason that Casa of Oregon uh, was approached to help with this project is because uh, we have a manufactured housing cooperative development department. Uh, we also have a real estate department. We have some folks here today, thank you so much, who are helping on the development side but our department has the manufactured housing background. Um, so um, what does that ownership look like? People own the home uh, and they own a share in the cooperative. Mm -hmm. uh, and that cooperative is run with a democratic process with a board. Uh, each share holder, each household has one vote uh, on community-wide decisions. And so it's similar. People are often uh, familiar with an HOA. It is similar to an HOA, but there are differences. But if you're just trying to kind of get a handle on things, it's similar to that model. Um, and in terms of speaking with, you know, the children and the younger folks and the families about homeownership and about what that offers, um, you know, of course, there's just an interpersonal family element of, of the conversations that are happening there. And actually because of our model, because we're forming the cooperatives and then allowing the co cooperatives to govern themselves, there's a lot of independence there on what the cooperative wants to do in education. Uh, but we do also have technical assistance and we also have some TA managers in the house. So thank you all. Um, and so we do have somebody who helps the cooperatives over time. Um, just to stay on track because most folks are not trained to run a nonprofit cooperative. They just live in a manufactured home park and are trying to make their life better. So we have technical um, assistance 
throughout um, their time as a cooperative. And so I think there is, there's always an opportunity for us as an organization to bring a resource to the cooperatives and say, here's something, if you all want to make use of this, distribute this, um, host some kind of training, um, that opportunity is always there. What are some of the challenges you've faced in getting under construction, given that it's been uh, a two and a half years since the fires? Um, are there some hurdles that are still need to be overcome or what's kind of the current timeline? And um, I really appreciate the community engagement approach, but it seems like it also needs to be paired with like a timely recovery response. Um, and what are some of the challenges on that end of things? John, do you wanna yeah. take a chronological approach yeah. to this answer? I think if you're talking in um, relationship to there are two different projects, right? When you're looking at uh, transitional housing versus then building back what uh, the cost is doing to permanent housing, there's one is just, you know, available short-term funds for transition housing. And, and that came from the state. We were very fortunate that state and private philanthropy donors funded that project. This is the first pilot project that's ever been done in the state of Oregon outside of a FEMA project. So it's a good model that can be utilized in the future there. In regards to uh, the CASA project, that was HUD financing uh, that will come forward in you know, Community Development Recovery Act funding that is be, will be instrumental in helping fund the housing recovery projects within the Southern Oregon area. That funding has to go through the federal government, which has this bureaucratic steps, right? So two years later, that funding has finally arrived to Oregon, and I believe they've probably started their first tranche of, you know, allocating those funds. But again, it takes time for the federal government process to go through. Again, I kind of go back, that process is broken, right? So we have to really think about, you know, from the time that FEMA came in and provided housing, uh, that was over a year, right? So you lose families. Families move, people, you know, they they have to still live, try and figure out. So we have to really think about that model and what that model looks like in the future and how we set funds aside to be able to do the transit housing, to have that temporary housing and then permanent housing. That's something we just have to do a better job as, as a country in the future here. Thank you. And uh, one other question I had was, what is the status of the local government of talent and how have you engaged with them? Yeah, I'll just tack on to give, get you maybe uh, the back end of your of your question, which is construction and timeline, and then I might punt back to John for some local government uh, response. So there's there are so many pieces in play, and I am also somebody who wants results now. Um, but to add on to the pieces that John just highlighted, which is just financing, which is just dollars, this particular project actually had to be um, uh, put together. So this was a park that was privately owned. Um, and thanks to John's assistance and many members in the community who came together to put the deal together, it was Coalición Fortaleza asking Casa of Oregon to step in as a, as a suitable nonprofit for the project. Uh, then it was putting the purchase together with funds for the purchase from the state with Casa of Oregon to even acquire the park from the previous owner. The previous owner um, did some re recovery work before the property got handed off. And so now we are closer to the construction phase. And to answer your question there, uh, I, I'm not sure if you work in manufactured housing or construction in general, but even with headlines alone, most folks know that there is a severe backlog of stock. Um, and there are also other parts of the country that are also experiencing climate disaster. So even if we raise our hands and say, yeah, yeah, we know everyone has orders in for homes, but we're the ones who are experiencing a climate disaster. There's also, we still have low inventory even for homes anywhere. So um you know, uh, we're pretty close to putting in an order for homes, uh, and that's really exciting. Um, and if you have questions, I, I hate the experience that it can uh, be to be a community member and feel like you don't, you want something now and you don't understand why. So if anybody wants to go more into the weeds on why, I promise you we can, <laughs> but uh, probably not right here. 
Um, but if you feel like you're being pushed around and you're not getting answers and nothing's happening and you want to understand what's happening, uh, please always feel free to reach out. Local government, right? I, I couldn't tell you there's not a better uh, mayor and council that represents the community at large there. And they truly believe in, you know, they're truly represented the whole community at large and really placed an emphasis on bringing their families back home. And that's something special and, you know, close to my heart to see, you know, to have a someone that's elected that really believes in a whole community and not just a certain voice, right? And so I'm really proud of doing the work we did for that community and helping bring in their families back home. And, and what a great uh, mayor and council that community has. Yeah, I think we would push on one another. I know there is many families still living in hotels. Um, and this is a great project. How many of those mobile parks are still need to be rebuilt? And what is your plan to help them? I mean, Casa did a great job selecting one mobile home park, but we're talking about 20, 40. I'm not, I don't know the number, but do you guys have plan to help the other people? And um, you were also saying leadership development needs to happen, right? Like the community need to bundle together. Unite Oregon is a nonprofit that works with immigrants and refugees for 20 years. So one, one thing that comes to my mind is we need to all bundle to make sure FEMA is helping everybody, not only people that have documentation status or make those funds available for everybody, because at the end of the day, national disasters don't select who they affect. So what is, uh, do you have any ideas of how you're gonna help the people outside this um, mobile park? Thank you. Thank you for your question, it's really important. Um, you guys are gonna require all this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the short answer is, most, if not, you know, mo parks are typically either privately owned or if in Oregon, if we've helped them, they're cooperatively owned. But if they're privately owned, uh, we have to have a willing uh, private landowner, a willing seller of the park to collaborate uh, with, with CASA, with a nonprofit. If it's in the middle of uh, recovery, that would be the process. Um, if a private homeowner or sorry if a private park owner has already redeveloped and we want to try and bring in some more com community first uh, approach to the park and convert it to a cooperative and they want to sell then we can um, you know we can support in that but uh, we can't force any private park owners to involve us in the recovery or anything to the, in that regard um I don't know um, of, you know, I don't have an inventory of all the manufactured home parks in the area. Like you said, there are others and there are folks who have not yet recovered. And in terms of banding together, I've just uh, recently, probably in the past couple months, and I've only been on the project for uh, a little under a handful of months, but um, been seeing how much work Unite Oregon and Access and um Jackson County Community Long-Term Recovery Group. And there are there are so many local organizations who are coming together and who are trying to make, get their own needs met and get community members needs met. And um, I know that uh, our organization is definitely interested in advocacy. And so uh, if there are particular um, needs that, you know, if it's um, particular, process that FEMA dollars are going through um, and folks are are getting missed, you know, um, I'm sure we are open to hearing that and trying to keep that in the conversation at the tables that we're at um, as much as possible. So thank you for bringing it up and certainly um, making sure that undocumented folks are also included in the recovery process is extremely important and should not be overlooked.
The only thing I would say is, you know, I know the state's been, you know, tracking all the different manufacturer parks. They reached out to try and see if any others were interested in sales. Um, they've also structured some, you know, tax credit savings for those current owners if they were to sell. So I think, you know, there's definitely been more emphasis on looking at how we can, in the state, you know, take manufactured parks to more to the co-op model. It's just going to take time, unfortunately, you know, for that to, to that transition to take place for now, so. Thank you um, for all of your hard work. And I just have a question because I want to go back to the beginning and ask you, how was your collaborative effort to prioritize community building initiated? Because in this disaster, people first say, I just need a place to live. Just give me a place to live, you know? And so, I so appreciate the work and the time that you set aside to focus on the community building side and the collaboration. So could you talk just a little bit about the leadership that initiated, how was that initiated? How was that prioritized? Uh, the, the cool part, um, which is also not surprising when we think about grassroots leadership and how much they are behind a lot of what happens in our communities, but um, it was from um, it was from the community themselves. It was from folks finding us and saying, "We think that you might be able to help us." Um, and so, in its infancy, and this predated me as well. So, uh, I am I am calling on uh, how this story has been illustrated to me. Um, and so, I do wish Erika was here and Rose Ojeda. Uh, was was really the CASA champion who uh, carried the beginning of this process. Um, and even uh, Rose being a wonderful, uh, experienced, uh, highly qualified, highly skilled Latino woman in her position was somebody who the local um, community members were seeking out in particular to have as part of the leadership, the nonprofit leadership that they were gonna collaborate with, which just speaks even more to representation um, and making sure that our, uh, you know, Salazar architect is a great example. Ernestina had in her introduction that part of what she's really excited about in her role here is to be in a diverse group of architects. And so across the board, I think the more that we are living our values, hopefully um, we'll be able to engage with the community in a more real way. And in this case, I can't take any credit and I don't think CASA can take the initiating credit because it came from community members reaching out and saying, can you help us? And I think all we're trying to do is not mess that up and say, yeah, we're here to help you um, and do that as best we can. And I also want to thank Alex Salazar here, you know, who really, you know, we we have a tendency because of our land plan state, right? We have all of our zoning, everything planned, and we're trying to always put everything in a box, right? Here's this volume we're trying to put in a box, right? And so, you know, thank you to Alex for bringing in place and in the, in the team, John and James, in to really think about turning it 180 degrees, right? And just think about, like, what does the community want? And, and let's go from that aspect instead of saying, here's what we're going to put in your backyard or here's what we think you should have, right? So Alex brought in this team and the community just completely embraced it. And it's just a great way to go through engaging all generations in the design process. So thank you, Alex, for that. I'll echo that. Um, I was just wondering, what are some like essential sustainability um, aspects that you um, do just in different properties or communities? Um, are you, can I clarify? Yeah. Um, I suppose it also kind of depends on who you're asking, but uh, for Casa of Oregon and our manufactured home parks, there's kind of our work. There would also be Salazar Architects' work mm -hmm. and their input, um, and perhaps we could all answer. And are you asking about uh, like environmental sustainability mostly, or yeah, like what are some things that the community can access easily to, um, yeah, that promotes like environmental sustainability and like um, community self-sustaining? Do you want to talk about it from architecture first? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Well, um, 
I think like a, a lot of help for our like designs, we got them through our like uh, internal labs. So we have uh, three labs that it's like a uh, well-being, like sustainability and community engagement. So every every project that we run through, like we have like uh, the the second like opinion for each of these labs. So um, these labs, they do like the research about like what elements are going to be specifically needed for the project and they offer like the best solution. So it's just like uh, the study of every every project with this like a uh, uh, inner colleagues uh, with a little bit more expertise on each subject of those to put together the best options and then present it to the community and also well and making this balance between like the budget and all this protocol situation so um just to make it a little bit shorter like the answer i think like it, it's a little bit hard because every project needs different situations so i think like a, it's just like they they run run the basis through or like internal um, protocols to design that is just like of course like trying to reduce like the impact of carbon like a uh what yeah like the well like try to, like check check the materials check the sustainability like all the like, like all the like um uh, systems to like an uh, internal environment process so i think like uh, there is like several of them that we try to encourage for like the projects to to have like these more integral solutions uh, do you want to add something tina um, I could add also that part of the design and the site just only, not only we took away from the, what we learned from the community, but we'll also um, apply uh, needs that apply in the sustainable, like having shade orientation buildings. In this, uh, particular in the talent mobile homes, we are working towards getting more greenage and then that will help with shade in, but however, it will also at the same time talking about resiliency and how that vegetation will be controlled so it would not be fire prone. Um, we'll, um, uh, in the community buildings, we're trying to create a spaces that will have, um, will be resilience for when the moment of fire and the emergency that you need to seek refuge, but you can also have windows that would open and have cross ventilation, ventilation, will have low VOC uh, materials inside the building. So it sources, local sources. Um, so there are, are many ways that will sustainable, but also at the same time, try to make it in a way that uh, the community can sustain themselves where there is a co-op. So it's not an expensive replacement. So things that they can actually easily can find and can replace without going through the hoops of finding uh, custom materials and that they can afford. Those are part of the small things that are I think it makes any any project better. And like I said, we we hearing and we're gonna understand how everybody's working through there. And then I'll just add um, a little bit about manufactured home element of it. And also one thing that we're working on uh, across the co-op that I think any new construction uh, is probably, or redevelopment is probably thinking about, and it's clean energy. So um, we also have this uh, wild joke of a trade-off of the time that we're in right now, which is shade trees uh, versus solar access. Um, and so, and tree canopy, not only for shade purposes, but also ecologically and things like that. So um, what I, is one thing that's really inspiring specifically about the talent area. And I'm, I'm sure there are other organizations around as well, but there's a group called Solarize Rogue who has been uh, a great advocate and support of our project so far. Uh, and one of the things that they're doing is community solar projects. So that's identifying sites, buildings, um, suitable locations to put a large array of panels that otherwise uh, wouldn't be really shaded or landscaped anyway, and then using that power for a particular community that might have shade trees or might not have as much solar exposure. So it's just relocating where the solar is actually being um, uh, captured, but it, then it's uh, being allocated toward a community who is invested in this community solar project. Um, the community solar projects also uh, send 10% of their power specifically out to a low-income power um, program 
for folks. So there's also because the co-op um, and all of our co-ops are uh, low income, there's that element as well that's being captured. Um, and then for manufactured homes, uh, there is definitely a large push to make them more sustainable um, than ever before. And there's a big question, uh, I think, ongoing about how we really either one, stretch the life of them because we often have a replacement uh, kind of rhetoric around manufactured homes that you use them until they don't work anymore, essentially, and they get replaced. Um, and I am interested in those conversations about building technology and manufactured home construction to also be more about repair. So we have more longevity and we don't have as much waste. So if we're placing new homes on the site, we do have to be as intentional as we can and really push the manufacturers and collaborate with the manufacturers as much as we can about what is the best product that we have available to us right now with the best materials and uh, the most longevity. I want to stick on time. Yeah. Well, thank you. I was wanna, I'm sorry that I think we're getting in our time on. I want to, um, this has been great question, great discussions, and I want to thank everybody who's been here, the panel, John, Christian, and Celestina, really, it's really great. Uh, we have our contact information is on the screen if you need to connect with us. We also have some uh, business cards and uh, brochures here if you want to uh, know about uh, Salazar, but um, welcome to come talk to us after the, the everything. So thank you so much. Okay.